And uh, the next speaker is Patricia. She's a catalyst um, and community organizer and business leader. Uh, he teaches on entrepreneurship, marketing, and social innovation. Uh, a few months ago, she started a very interesting uh, adventure. Uh, she started a, a wearable lab without funding and sponsorship. So today, she's going to share uh, her experience of doing things in the Ling way. Welcome. Thank you, Lily. Before I get started, um, I wanted to take a minute because I have to run to the airport when I'm done um, to thank everybody who has hosted me, um, everybody who's been involved with uh, Maker Fair, and um, I just really, really have been um, so welcomed. I've met so many interesting people globally. And um, I would like to give Maker Fair a big round of applause. interested in things that girls typically weren't and I really did experience probably by the time I was 12 or 13 that messaging that said you don't belong here you're not smart enough you don't know what you're doing and I remember being again kind of angry but also being really really motivated uh, to do what they said I couldn't do when I was growing up in Sri Lanka the boys kind of felt that it's uh, mathematics for boys and uh, the girls shouldn't be involved in it. So that I took it as a challenge and I continued to learn ma more mathematics and I think currently I excel in mathematics. <laughs> STEM because there isn't anyone to look up to um, and so young girls aren't really exposed to STEM as a career path. It's the same thing in the tech sector where less than 5% of technology startups are created by women. It prevents other women from seeing themselves in those same roles and it just compounds the problem. When we look at successful female engineers, uh, women who are successful with uh, technology companies, they're often positioned as the exception rather than the rule, and that's a disincentive. It, it's hard to imagine that you can be successful there if somehow other women are portrayed as being special in some way. I think STEM is pretty broad, so uh, it really depends on which particular industry you're talking about, I suppose, and, and what industry that, that women are interested in. Um, but in general, it, to the extent to which there's been a lack of representation of women in some of these industries, it just brings another perspective. It, it, uh, it adds more diversity to the, to the discipline, and I think that's really important. We can encourage young girls to get involved in STEM by exposing them to STEM career paths. And really, it starts with parents and educators. In introducing these career paths to these young girls. I think if we encourage our young girls to be fearless and exploratory and curious, then they'll naturally fall into the STEM careers. We also need to change the language around how we talk about things like math and science. So little girls aren't saying, I'm bad at math. Instead, they're saying, I'm really good at math. I think that uh, young women can get started in STEM by believing themselves they can do it and also enjoying what they do, these two things will take them a long way. Mount Royal 
Davos helping change the culture of women in STEM because of the kind of institution and university it is. So we believe in cross-campus teams, we believe in interdisciplinary teams, we believe in playing to our students' strengths. And ultimately what that does, by the time you graduate and leave us at Mount Royal University, is you're good to go. You've got the confidence, you own your intelligence, and you stand in your intelligence, and you are ready to contribute. I'm really optimistic about the role of women in STEM. Uh, I can only speak to my experience in biology, because that's my discipline, but ever since I've arrived at Mount Royal in 2007 full-time, I can say that the majority of students in our classrooms, not just sort of equalization, but I'd even start, start to say majority of students in our classrooms uh, are female students. In fact, even in some of the senior courses, I'm seeing a lot of women getting involved in research projects as well. For example, last semester in my senior physiology class, out of the nine people that took it, only one was male. Uh, so I think we're seeing a lot of women getting involved in It's that's the problem. Our young girls in science. Biology, because that's my distance. In fact, even in some of the senior courses, I'm seeing a lot of women getting involved in research projects as well. For example, last semester in my senior physiology class, out of the nine people that took it, only one was male. Uh, so I think we're seeing a lot of women getting involved in not only in biology courses, biology programs, uh, but also uh, biology research experiences as well. I'm pretty optimistic about the future of women in STEM. Um, it's being recognized as, as an issue that enrollment is down in post-secondary institutions to these fields. So it's important that programs like Explore IT um, continue to encourage students and young girls to explore STEM in STEM as a career path. I'm really excited about the future of women in STEM. I think we live in an age where technology's never been more democratic. I think anybody can meet a community and solve whatever they want to solve. And I'm delighted that there are lots of ways for girls and young women to be involved in that. And what we find now is anybody can reach out anywhere globally in this world, come into community spaces, and do anything, anything that they can imagine. I, I think it's an incredibly empowering space for girls. Excellent. So I'm here to talk about how to start uh, spaces that are inclusive, spaces that recognize unique talents and abilities, and um, spaces really where any idea can flourish. Um, so I am a co-founder with 12 other individuals of um, a place called Arc Loft, and we opened Canada's first wearables and maker space um, in Calgary uh, about 100 days ago at the beginning of March. And we did this on our own. So what I want to share with you is our business model. How do you do this? How do you walk out of this room, find 11 people you really, really would like to work with and do a project like this with and um, get started without major sponsorship, just using a lean startup model and getting right to work? So I think part of what I can say I share in common with my other catalysts at Arcloft is um, a yes, let's attitude. So it can be intimidating. I really, really believe that to um, imagine that you can put together a space like this with individuals, without a sponsor, without major funding. Um, and think about uh, even looking at space and, and leasing a space that uh, you can do this in. Um, and so what we did to start with is there is an incredible amount of information out there um, from the maker community on how different maker spaces have been built, and that's certainly where we started. And what we felt comfortable doing was saying, let's try. Let's try this for 90 days. Let's try this for the next four months, and let's see how it goes. So we framed it as an experiment that felt less risky. It felt comfortable for uh, a number of people involved in the venture. 
And um, that was the approach we took. So why did we want to do this? We actually had already been collaborating. So a number of the people involved had already been talking. Um, my company, Torch Motorcycles, had been interacting with Make Fashion. Um, and down the line and down the line, we had friends with 3D printers. We had friends with uh, different sorts of uh, equipment um, and machinery that they would bring to the projects. We were already makers, builders. We all had different uh, strengths and abilities, and we all felt like um, if we found the right sort of space, we would be able to do better together than any one of us could do on our own. Um, there's safety in numbers, isn't there? And um, that was part of what we were uh, building from. Um, we were already putting money into our own companies. So small and modest amounts, um, again, not with everything we needed. So the idea was to bring everything together, bring all of our resources together. Everything from, gosh, just simple tables right through to um, some pretty uh, advanced uh, desktop production equipment. Um, and we really wanted to build a sustainable community. We didn't want to worry about whether our sponsor would stay with us or um, in Canada, you can write grants sometimes and your grants come and go. Um, and so we wanted to do it ourselves. We really wanted to, to build a different business model. So we started like any business does, and that is um, in framing our intent. And we had both a strategic and a creative intent. Um, so we wanted a sustainable community. Um, we wanted to engender creativity, experimentation. We wanted to advance each of our own projects, but we also were really, really interested in creative intersections. And so what does it mean for me to um, get to know Make Fashion a little bit more and learn more about their relationship to Seed Studio, for example? I don't think I'd be here if we didn't have that kind of um, intersection and conversation. Our creative intent, we wanted the place to be vibrant and alive and have a lot of people in it. And one of the reasons I played the video I did um, is much of it was shot in our space. So I was. I was trying to think this morning, how can I show you this space? I was like, ah, oh, we just had the video done for the university. So you can see a lot of people. You can even see my dog is in the space half the time. Coco comes to work with me. And um, she is loved by everyone. She look, get a pet for your maker spaces. Bring a pet. There should be a shop dog in, in every maker space. Um, we really wanted to honor also where different makers were at. And what I mean by that, and I'm going to talk about um, how that looks in our space in the next slide, is that we didn't assume everybody wanted to go to market. We wanted to create a space. If you were sitting at a workbench for the first time, soldering your first uh, circuit, building your first blinky, just figuring out what the maker movement was about, that there was literally a physical space that you could go do that. We would meet you, we would greet you, we would include you, and it was just a really comfortable, really easy way to, um, to not feel intimidated. Um, we are part of an ecosystem in Calgary of, of maker spaces, it's quite common. Um, but for example, we have another space in our city um, it's really difficult to walk in if you're a woman. Like, it's like little groundhogs. You walk in the front door and all these heads pop up from their, they're working on drones and robots and all kinds of incredible projects, but there are no women in that space. And so that, that we were trying to break down that energy as well. So what we have constructed are three physical spaces. We have about 2,400 square feet. Um, so I would guess that that is about the size of the theater from where I'm standing to the back. And what we have in one creative zone are these workbenches, these very democratic spaces where you're made to feel welcome, 
You can come in and start small projects. We host our workshops there um, and so forth. We have a mid space. So once you feel comfortable and confident about, hey, uh, I didn't know I could work with an Arduino, look at me, this is amazing. That middle space is about starting ima to imagine what you want to do and make fashion sits there. For, so for those of you who saw the show last night um, or have met any of the team from Make Fashion, Make Fashion's intent is not to be commercial. Make Fashion's intent is to be provocative, to come up with these conceptual ideas, to tell stories uh, through the fashion and technology that they integrate. But they are not, you know, they're about that creative act and they're about honoring their creators. But it's a really cool, like, to look up from the one bench once you've built your blinky and to see one of their garments and go like, huh, I could do that. I can come sit over there. So this mid space is really about, um, we call them little micro communities of users. So um, we're not anti-drone, so sometimes the drone folks sit there, um, but the make fashion community sits there and other interest groups sit in that middle as well. So you're, you're moving from the basic literacies of making into some creative projects. And then finally, we have a go-to-market space as well. And that's where Torch Motorcycle sits. So you, again, have this vision, if you're looking across the room, to say, hmm, those guys are actually developing product. They're going to market. There's a brand identity there. Um, they know how to talk to funders. Um, they know how to come to China and meet people and imagine Torch um, in China and, and brokering relationships over here. I'm going to walk over to that part of the room when I'm ready and I'm going to be a part of that. And of course, it goes without saying that Torch is constantly, there are five members of our team, we have another um, uh, space for five interns at all time. We're down at the workbench teaching people how to solder and work with Arduino for the first time. So it's a very, very democratic open space. Uh, where did we get our name? We actually sat together as a community and did um, a creative exercise led by one of our team members. And um, we discovered the word uh, arc. Um, and um, there's a goddess, a Greek goddess involved, and she is the goddess of beginnings or origins, a source of action. And we are on the second floor of a particular building, so it made sense to tag loft onto it, and thus our loft was brand, uh, branded. But all of our smaller communities are present, including two tenants that we have. One is a coffee shop. And you're like, hmm, that doesn't seem very makerish, but our coffee shop is amazing. So they're called Latte Art Love, and they actually illustrate in the foam of your cappuccino anything that you want to see. So it's amazing. If, if Seed Studios came over for coffee, Seed Studios would be in the foam of the latte and so forth. And we have a retail space as well. Coffee is a, is an, or a great tea is a very, very powerful, uh, uh, a source of creativity, fuel for creativity. Um, so we're all present. People know who we are. If someone's coming in looking for Make Fashion, they'll see the Make Fashion banner, um, but it all, it all ha happens under one roof. So how did we do, how did we, how did we do this with dollars and cents? Um, real common sense approach, what do we need to cover the cost of the space? Um, our second priority was actually being able to pay a manager for the space. And it'll be evident why shortly. Um, and any money then coming above that essentially goes into a common fund. And so we're talking about, we're looking at laser uh, cutters right now. And so as we generate revenue, um, that money then gets directed to the equipment fund and that sort of thing. We have not set out to be a, a for-profit, um, but as you'll see on the last spreadsheet, it actually, these spaces can be very lucrative. 
Um, so we see the capital purchases. And then say I wanted to fly someone in um, to talk to us about, tell me your project again, Liz. Futures Research. Uh, that we could afford to actually fly Lynn into the city to host a workshop with someone who is working with cities and innovation in their cities. And um, we would have the funds to do that. So again, uh, growing our community. So um, how did we do this? Our um, catalyst, the 12 of us, each pay $450 a month. So the total amount for the space is about $6,000 a month. And the idea was to find 12. That's our kind of sweet spot, not too big, not too small. And those 12 catalysts, they pay their rent, but what they get access to is our calendar of workshops. And so what we sketched out right away was different ways that a maker in one workshop could make back their $450. So although you had to make the commitment, and we asked each catalyst to do two workshops a month, that's it. Otherwise, you could sit away and, and work on your own. These are all of the different ways, whether you had a smaller workshop for a higher price or a very low-priced film screening, for example, you could make your rent back in a day. And that, that is as simple as this model was to achieve the budget priority number one. So we write our, our landlord a check every month, we host workshops every month, we grow our community every month, and we are already in the black, already. So these are, this is just a, a sketch out we did in January of what that looked like. So we already met priority number one. On the first day of March, when we opened 100 days ago, and we continue to meet that priority. And what we're on to now is the accumulation of funds to pay our manager. And the reason why, oh, it's coming up down there, but that's okay, I can look up here. The reason why is that um, our workshops will then become our primary source of revenue. And so what you're looking at here, I'll just take you through it quickly. Our Catalyst founders, there are 12 of us, we call, we're culture starters, we want you to be excited about making, we wanna show you our projects, we wanna hear about your projects. That's our job. We're the culture builders of our cloth. And so we're paying 450 a month, we're covering off our salary, um, and annually, this is how much we are, are putting into our operation. We've got our retail anchors, so that's the coffee shop, and we've got a storefront as well. So you can pick up kits there, um, all kinds of things. The Maker Fellows are an interesting idea because once we hit our 12 catalysts, what if someone comes along, and I always use this, this example at home, who's really passionate about pickle boats? and they just wanna build pickle boats. And, and they, they can't be a catalyst, but how can they get involved in our loft? We ask you to come in for three months and you can do workshops on pickle boats all three months, intro to pickle boats, intermediate pickle boats, and advanced pickle boats. And then you can go into the pickle boat regatta. Um, and uh, what we do is 75% of what they earn goes back to them and 25% goes back into our fund for our manager and for capital expenses. So it's a beautiful way for people who are passionate about steampunk design or someone who wants to come along and, and make some of those amazing products for Pebble. Um, they can come in, pull up to a bench and, and, uh, and get involved. And then finally, we have a maker membership category. Um, what you see in the second block here is the number of workshops that are possible in a month. And they're just those different formats that I had on the previous screen. So if someone comes in for seven hours, a corporate team wants to come in and do some team building, do some making, um, do some um, 
even skunk works, this idea that we can't solve the problem, we can't seem to overcome an obstacle at work, okay, get out of the office and come down and work with us for a day and we'll see if we can help you push that program around. Um, the number of evening workshops, uh, we have this maker happy hour. So we're right in downtown Calgary. You can leave your office building and come and have cocktails and make things for a couple of hours right after work. Um, you can come on the weekend for day longs, evening, weekend, half, you get the idea. But this is the total maximum um, kind of programs we can build in per month. But you can see that when we're at capacity, when you're at capacity with this kind of business model, the income after expenses is close to a half million dollars. So it's dead simple. It's a lean startup. You need 12 friends. Um, I would suggest that they be diverse friends. We have a photographer. We have a, a fashion uh, startup. We've got our go-to-market with Torch. Uh, we've got a 3D print friend, um, and so forth and so on. We have some, some design folks. And um, that is the beginning, middle, and end of how to build your own wearables lab and makerspace. Thank you.